Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. Um, welcome to this new episode of the Power Series. Today, Positive Luxury's co-founder and CEO Diana Verde Nieto will be in conversation with three amazing guests. Lisa Snowden, the radio and TV presenter, Susie Rogers, the Paralympic gold medalist, and Adam Schumann, the film producer, co-founder of the jewelry brand James Blank Design. Uh, they will be discussing how to stay positive through challenges. So we'll have 15 minutes at the end to answer all your questions. Please submit them through the Q&A box you can see at the bottom of your screen and we'll answer them at the end. Over to you, Diana. Thank you so much, Claudia. And thank you so much, Lisa, Adam and Susie for joining me today. Um, I am in incredibly privileged to uh, share the next 45 minutes with you and um, uh, the pos positive actors is something that you guys have in buckets. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to start with you, Lisa, because you know, you have, every time I meet you, you're bubbly and doesn't matter what happens anywhere, you always have this, yes, I can do it. So what does it take to be Lisa Snowden? Oh gosh, okay. Well, firstly, thank you for having me. It's a real honor to be with Susie and Adam and of course with you, Diana. But um, okay, so uh, food and water. I need regularly feeding and, and watering <laughs> and occasionally the odd something stronger perhaps. But um, I think for me, it's about um, connection with people. I need that connection. I need love. Um, and I need routine, you know, something like that. But routine is very important for me, especially now. So, um, you know, and I think also I need to be connected to myself and that is, that comes from the routine. So it's about having that grounding feeling. Um, and so, you know, whether it's getting on my mat in the morning, doing some meditation, doing some breathing, doing some movement, you know, just having that routine helps me to center myself, to ground myself. And then I think that I'm able to kind of handle stuff that comes my way if I'm grounded and if I'm connected mostly to myself. Obviously, the love and the connection with other people is hugely important, but I do need to have that sort of grounding and that sort of, um, yeah, that sort of that stability within myself, I think, in order for me to function on day to day. Thank you, Lisa. And I mean, Adam, you have, you wear many hats, but one of them is uh, you're a fantastic jewelry designer. Uh, Thank you. you make the most incredible butterfly. Know that I have a crush on butterflies, of course. Um, <laughs> so tell us a bit more about your jewelry brand, um, James Banks, mm -hmm. and what keeps you with this incredibly positive attitude? Yeah, so James Banks is, is completely, it's a, it's a total love story. It's something that came out of, um, of, of inspiration in life. It was not something I expected to do at all. Like you said, I, I, you know, I do wear many hats, but I'm, I'm always creative. Um, with James Banks, it really came so naturally to me. Um, my, my girlfriend at the time is an artist and she's now my wife. Um, she said something to me that inspired me. And then she said another thing that inspired me. And I kept making pieces for her that were meant to be one-offs that she would only wear. And people were really moved by them. They were moved by the messaging of them. They were moved by the premise that we, uh, that we work with, which is impregnated biography, which allows you to, as the wearer, um, add your narrative to the piece. So it's sort of a beautiful interaction between the art, the creativity, and the person who's wearing it. So each piece is unique. Um, so, so really, you know, to, so to answer your question, our company is really created you know, Lisa, like you said, it's, it's love. It's created out of love. It was, it was formed from inspiration. And then I learned that my grandfather used to do the same thing for my grandmother when they were together. And so we aptly named the company after him and sort of honoring the family. So it's, it's a company that is, is, um, is all handmade. My, my partner, Heidi, is a brilliant metalsmith who studied in, in Germany and in Florence, and you can feel the soul in the craft, everything's handmade, and you can see, feel the poetry in it because everything has a story. Does that answer your, your question? Yes, of course, thank you so much for sharing. And, you know, kind of from jewelry to, well, also gold, but this time it's gold medalist. Um, <laughs> you are British Paralympic 
uh, gold medalist in swimming and you've done it in Rio, right, Susie? Um, what does it take to keep the focus, the strength, the, you know, that time and to actually win a gold medal? Very jealous, by the way. <laughs> Can I just say, quite, quite sadly, Adam, it's not completely solid gold, but it's because it's quite large. So I, I, wish, I wish it was, because then I, I would re retire permanently. Um, but but in, in terms of um, sport, I mean, what, what it takes to win gold is um, a lot of hard work. Um, it's, it's basically sacrificing pretty much all of your life to this pursuit of this one goal, um, becoming very fixated on it, um, being absolutely committed to that goal, um, you know, putting, putting all the work into to learn about your sport, to learn about yourself, to learn about your body, to learn about the people you compete against, to maximize your strengths and to be able to use them in a very kind of small window of time. Um, to rehearse as we were sort of talking in our preparation about it, you know, to rehearse it all so that it's like a performance when you go out on stage. Um, and so it's kind of automatic really. Um, but also you've got to be able to cope with the pain. Um, I still remember some of my hardest training sessions in the pool at, you know, five o'clock in the morning in the dark of winter um, and jumping into a cold pool. And now I look back and think, what on earth was I doing? Um, but you know, it, there's, there's some kind of drive in you and you know, it, it, it spurs you on because there's that, that will to believe that you can achieve something like that. And when you actually do, I can't even put into words the feeling of it. You know, it's just the most incredible feeling that I've ever had. Um, and I don't think I'll ever get that feeling again. I, or I, I hope I do, but I'm not sure I will. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. So I mean, incredibly inspired. I can't, I can't quite imagine. So hats off to you. Um, and here's a question for you all. I mean, how do you deal with rejection? How do you deal with failure? How, I mean... What does it take to, to overcome this in your different professions? And I'd like to start with, uh, with you, Adam, because like, you know, you have been a film producer, an actor, a jewelry designer. So, you know, I'm sure you have been rejected in, uh, in mm -hmm. many of those things. So how do you do Oh yeah. I actually brought my rejection list with me. <laughs> oh goodness, wow. <laughs> well, I think success starts with failure, right? It's like, so. Yeah. 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 And I think that, that there are all different types of rejection. I think one of the reasons why I left acting or moved away from acting to something that was more within my grasp of control, like jewelry or producing or even um, directing or writing, is because when you're an actor, you know, you're waiting for somebody. So in terms of dealing with, with that type of rejection, to be perfectly honest, I just sort of moved away and, and and made spaces for myself where my art was my own and I wasn't beholden to other people. Um, with regard to, you know, rejection, rejection as an artist is interesting because you can, you can really allow it to be about the creative process and a difference of creativity, you know, whereas I think, you know, like rejection in other ways um, can, can maybe, um, it can, it, for me at least, can, can kind of throw me off. But when it comes to art, it doesn't throw me off. It kind of gives me more inspiration. It makes me look at things from a different light. It makes me wonder how I might be able to do it differently and, and, and try and work with it. So with rejection, I, I, I guess I just see it very differently. I, I, try to, I try to look at it more like martial arts where if something's coming towards you, you repurpose it, you reimagine it, re, you reuse it, you rework with it. Um, so that's what, that's how I, that's how I use rejection and that's how I transform rejection into something that is useful for me because the rejection seems like a dead end. Otherwise, you know, I'd rather be productive. Yeah, of course. I mean, I mean, Lisa, for you it might be similar. I mean, you, you're a performer TV presenter. So how, how did you deal with that, uh, in your career? Well, I mean, like Adam says, rejection takes on so many different forms. You know, it can be like professionally, but also relationship-wise and things like that. And it can kind of hit you 
at the most unexpected times but because I've been in the industry for 30 years and I've kind of moved from different sort of so firstly I started modeling there was so much rejection in modeling like every day pretty much for the first few years I was like going on jobs wouldn't get it you know and initially you start thinking oh god you know what what could I've done differently is it the way I look is it was I not mm. tall enough was I not blonde enough but it's like and you start to kind of analyze it a little bit but then you start to you know it gets you it, it's character building it's really good for like thickening your skin and like adam mm -hmm. says if you don't get something you know it's for a reason most of the time and i think it's really important to have those days where you you, you where well, you don't get yeses all the time you know and i think that it was the same in modeling and then that kind of helped me prepare for the television industry the broadcasting industry where again you're going up for jobs and you don't always get them and you know it's it's frustrating sometimes and, and you, you can't help but have a moment of reflection and sort of think you know is it my fault you know but then I think it does make you stronger and I think if you just look at the bigger picture and you just take a deep breath and maybe have a moment of reflection maybe have a moment of feeling a little bit low about it but then you just pick yourself up and you just realize that there's something else out there that you're meant to be doing um, you know and if it is hard because some days you really want something and then you don't get it but then when you do get something and you've got that feeling of achievement and um, you know, it's just, it's just having that sense of self. And I think sometimes it's easy just to take a moment, take a deep breath and reevaluate everything. And just sometimes to look at the bigger picture and to realize that, you're not that maybe wasn't meant for me. You know, that wasn't my path. That wasn't, I wasn't supposed to be with that person or I wasn't supposed to be broadcasting on that or, or advertising that job or whatever it may be. But I think it's just good to look at the bigger picture and sometimes just breathe and just refocus. Thank you That's so much, Lisa. Thank you. I mean, um, Susie, for you it's about time, right? <laughs> how, do you, how do you deal with that? Because you're competing against yourself. So I think this is kind of, I guess, harder. I don't know. How, how does it feel for you? I think it's pretty similar to Adam and Lisa, to be honest. You know, if you're, a, if you're an entrepreneur, if, you know, there's success and there's failure and there's a fine line. If you're acting, if you're in media, I mean, frankly, I don't know how you do it because I think I would struggle to be that in that industry where you're judged based on how you look and that kind of thing. But, mm. you know, many in many ways in sport, you know, you're based, you're, you are judged on how you look as well in terms of how you perform, uh, how your body performs. And sometimes there are things that are just out of your control that you, you can't change, you know. Um, it could be an injury or an illness. Um, and there's not really a lot that you can do about that. And, and I've had moments, really dark moments as an athlete, where I've been unable to race and unable to perform. And then the threat of losing my funding and that my, my income um, hangs over me. And, you know, I, I, I think that can be quite terrifying. So it takes a certain level of resilience, I think, across all of our sectors to be able to cope with that. Um, and I would say for me, I try to not, I mean, this is going to sound very corny, but I try to not look at failure as failure. I try, I, someone once said to me, everything in life is a victory or a lesson. And I think you can mm -hmm. learn from anything that goes wrong. And in a way, I find that my successes um, very much come off the back of periods of difficulty where I've been rejected. And I'm sure, you know, Lisa and Adam, you, you know, it's the same for you, and Diana, it's the same for you all. Um, you know, and, and you've just got to sort of, got to be com comfortable with that but I mean I use psychological tools that I've used for years as an athlete that really helped me so you know uh, Lisa mentioned breathing um, you know those techniques of breath control meditation you know yoga mm -hmm. these kinds of things that I find are very helpful they're not helpful for everybody but I think everyone needs to sort of develop their own sort of coping tools that they can sort of dip into really um, and I find yeah. that helps as well. And also, Susie, did you, when we had our little chat yesterday, you also mentioned visual, visualization as well. So like you can mm -hmm. visualize for different eventualities within yeah. your race, which I find fascinating. Yeah, like that, I'd love to hear more about that because, you know, obviously you want to win as an athlete, but you mm -hmm. know, how do you then prepare for, for if you come second or third or fourth, like, how do you do that? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting one. And I think, I mean, I don't know many other athletes that did this, but I certainly did it. Um, I sat down with my psychologist and we went through every single scenario. So how are you going to feel if you win? How are you going right. to feel if you come second, third and you don't? 
Um, and then I just went through the emotions of that and almost rehearsed them. And in a way that's quite helpful to lockdown because if you think of the situation we're in now, we're sort of caught up in, um, you know, an uncertainty, aren't we? No one knows what the outcome is going to be. No one knows what's going to happen. So when you're, when you've got an uncertainty as an outcome, how, how do you cope with it? Well, you've got to sort of almost be comfortable with those different outcomes and different scenarios. So, you know, am I comfortable with continuing in lockdown? Am I comfortable with the world going back to a different state? Am I, you know, so it's trying to sort of put yourself forwards and then work mm-hmm. backwards as it were. Yeah, I do a similar exercise, which is, and then what? You know, so at the end of everything that occurs, you say, and then what? And you keep following that down. And then you realize that when you follow that thread, that really, you know, it's just about acceptance. Mm. You know, to bring it back to you, Diane, and the butterfly, it was occurring to me yesterday when we were talking, This it starts as a terrestrial being. It's a caterpillar. It has no idea, probably, that it's going to become a butterfly. But it just does. One day it's terrestrial and one day it's flying. And appreciating and leaning into that unknown quality of what might happen, you know, like, like you were just saying, Susie, it's, I think that is how you deal with failure that, with the most ease and grace because you just let it move through you. Yeah. Like trusting, trusting that, you know, yeah. that, that you're going to be okay and that the universe has got you and that you, you're going to be able to ride out any storm that kind of exactly and that you're also not that significant yeah in the scheme of things yeah you're not you're just yeah you know you're just you're just changing all the time we're changing all the time yeah totally oh Oh, i think you're on mute diana (laughs) (laughs) we need you diana (laughs) (laughs) we had a lull we were going though forever (laughs) no you definitely don't need me you guys can talk for ever pretty much (laughs) yes no i I was curious to 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 ask um where do you find the strength because you know as an entrepreneur my constant is failure and from failure comes standing up and keep going i mean and do things differently and change things and like you say like lean into into that you know into kind of what do you want to create and and then what, and then what, and then what, but where do you find the strength? I mean, where do you find the strength to get up at five o'clock in the morning and train? Where do you find the strength to actually turn up again, which you know how hard it feels? And Adam, where do you find the strength to, you know, write something amazing and then said no, or turning up to a casting and said no, or creating a piece of jewelry that is not sold? I mean, where do you guys find the strength? I mean, please (laughs) help. (laughs) How wants to go first? <laughs> you go, Lisa, if you want. Well, I mean, I just, you have to dig deep, you know, like some days you just have to dig deep, you know, like I was thinking about Susie and like, you know, I've, I've did eight years doing the breakfast show, getting up in the middle of the night to go and broadcast. And it was, like you said, some, I didn't have to get into a cold swimming pool, which would have been absolutely hell for me, but um, it was still middle of the night, freezing cold, getting out there in the snow and trying to get to work while everybody else was asleep and also sacrificing your social life and everything else that goes with those unsociable. You know, I think back to when I was right at the beginning and I lie in bed at night, I was in this rented flat in London and I had no money. Like I remember lying there thinking the, for, the rent's coming up. How am I going to pay my bill? You know, and that was the most terrifying situation. I was like, mm-hmm. what can I sell? I don't have anything of any worth. And I was just lying there. And so I just, you find something from somewhere, you just dig deep and you just want to have that sense of purpose, that sense of achievement. That's how I did it. And I, and I, and I felt positive that I was going to be able to do that. Um, but there were, like Susie said, moments, and Adam, you said it too, where you have been at a real low and you just find that strength from somewhere. I mean, I, I did. And I can see that everybody else that's on here today has too. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I just think, like you said, we're, we're resilient. You know, we can find it from somewhere um, if you really want it. And I think we all have that um, capacity and capability. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was mine. That's my story. No, that's yours. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, Adam. Oh, me. Okay. Susie, yeah. um, what, what, whatever you like, whatever you like. Oh, okay. Um, well, I mean, I'd, I'd sort of follow on from that, I suppose. Um, 
I think strength for me um, comes from moments of adversity. So they come from moments of really being, you know, as Lisa says, as Adam's touched on, you know, your absolute lowest. Um, where I suppose it does get you to dig into the deeper part of yourself and realise, you know, I'm I'm at, I'm in this space, but I've got to come out of it. And um, I mean, I suppose one of the one of the I mean, I've had lots of different times in my life, as we all have, that have been up and down. But um, you know, a, a pivotal moment for me as an athlete was when I came fourth in London 2012 at Paralympic Games in the 50 meter butterfly, which is my main event. I went in ranked um, second in the world, and I just felt mm. like the biggest failure. And I've never felt anything like it. You know, you come out the pool, you know, you get cameras shoved in your face you've got to try and hold it together and be okay on camera. And, you know, you do have to act, you've got to put on a game face and then you go around the corner and then no one can see you just completely break down. And I remember just, you know, the person who just won gold, uh, I won't mention her name, but she was, you know, celebrating in front of me. And it was just so difficult to take that. Um, it was like a kick in the teeth. And, um, I just remember that that was my motivation right there, right then, was just, this is not going to happen again. I will do everything I can to never let that happen again. And four years later, I, I won, but it took a lot of planning and it took a lot of rethinking how I was doing things, throwing everything out, innovation, creative ways of approaching it, you know. Um, so I guess, yeah, sport in a way can be a create, creative thing as well. You know, it, it's... Cool. It, it, you know it just it depends on how you I suppose how you look at it and, and the context but um but yeah I think the strength comes from that and having a goal and and having something that really that you're fixated on and actually the hardest thing when you retire which you'll see with other athletes because I've seen after other athletes say they really struggle with their mental health when they retire is is what now because you've got to the top and when you do get to the top I'm sure it's the same with acting when you get to the top of your profession and you've won every thing that you possibly win well what, what do you do then um, you know, if you've done the best presenting job, you know, what do you then go on to do if you your business is so successful and you just don't know where next to take it? And I think that's the hard part um, that people really wrestle with. But then it's about shifting and moving forwards. I'm a great believer in continuing to keep moving forwards, you know, and, yes. and to keep going. Yeah, I'm a believer in that, too, and kind of not not getting too far ahead and not getting too stuck in the past and staying in the moment. And I think what you both, it sounds like you both described to me is a version of, of betting on yourself and believing in yourself. Because I think at the end of the day, if you don't do that, if you can't believe in yourself and you can't get behind what you're doing, then where you're not, then nobody's gonna believe in you, you know? And I think that for me, that's sort of the shift that happened by starting my own business and doing my own thing is that I just, I had to believe in it myself. And even if it doesn't sell, it wasn't necessarily about, it's not, a, obviously we need to pay the bills. We need to make money. That's what life's about. But this, but the not selling of it's not the failure. The coming in second place is, is not the failure, right? That's not really the failure that I, I don't think that you're experiencing. It's something else. It's the ego telling you something. And so for me, that's when I get too far ahead and too far behind. I become separate from myself and I judge myself. But if I'm where I am, then I'm exactly where I need to be. And so for me, the way I do that, that is I do a meditation exercise, which is it's um, intentionality paintings and they're pulses and they're continuous pulses. And those pulses that I draw, they're either one thought continuous. And if the thought changes, I stop or they're the absence of thought. And if a thought comes in my mind, then I stop. But it's a dedication to being present. And for me, that's where I find my strength is just being here, you know? That's my yeah, strength that's, and, believe, and, 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 and believing in myself. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. And that's, that, that in the moment piece is, is, so, is so important um, for people to try and learn if they can. It's very hard, I mean, to be able very. to do that, yeah. Yeah, yeah and especially you get, now, you know, go ahead. Sorry, Lisa. No, no, I was, I was just agreeing because you get caught up in everything and then you, you, you lose your train of thought and you become very unfocused if you're thinking too much about the past, too much about the future. It is about that mindful feeling and yeah. state of, you know, and it's, it's, that is so powerful because then you can be really focused and you can just really yeah. zone in on what you need to do. 
rather than does, just. But it, but, but it also doesn't mean, for me at least, it doesn't mean denying the things that are occurring, right? So like everything is happening right now. Nothing can interrupt you because you're so present, but that doesn't take away from the fact that there is volition around us. Um, I'm trying to think of, of, it's like, do you know the, the Rumi poem, The Guest House? You know, you treat everything like a guest house. Your emotions, your anger, your sadness, you let them be there, you let them be there, but you don't make them necessarily part of your family. You know, you just let them come and go and you observe them. Yeah, wow. that's, that, that's very much yoga, isn't it as well? Because my, my mom's a yoga teacher. So I've gr been brought up with, um, you know, techniques to observe thoughts and to let them go and to let them come in and go in your mind. And that definitely helps. Yeah. yeah, because the denying, like for me, I'll just be totally candid when this first, when this quarantine happened, I think for me, what happened was I felt like, oh my gosh, I have all this time to be creative and, you know, I'm going to create all these amazing things and I'm going to finish this book that I started, blah, blah, blah. And then that's where, that's where I started to see that demon appear a little bit for me and judge me and make me feel unworthy and make me feel like, um, like I wasn't doing enough, not accomplishing enough. And that was getting ahead. I got ahead of myself. I was like, oh, I'm going to do all this stuff 10 years down the road. And then you, just, <laughs> you paralyze, you're paralyzed. I think that happened to a lot. I don't know. That happened to me for sure. You just suddenly think, you know, I'm going to, like you said, have all this time, learn a language, get a six pack, yeah. do this, do that. And then you're like, wait a minute, why the pressure? This is so alien mm. to all of us. You know, let's exactly. just pause and just all pick up the phone, communicate more, you know, check in yeah. on people and just check in on ourselves and just chill for a bit because it's just, exactly. there's nothing we can do. It's just beyond our control. I totally agree totally. with you. I, I, I was guilty of that too in the beginning. I was yeah. like, I need to do all these things. Mm. Because I think it was sort of like, for, I think it was, you know, time shifted so rapidly. It was kind of, it was kind of like when you're in space and you have zero gravity and you're floating or when you're, you know, you're rear ended and it's that, you know, that moment where just, you know, time and speed alternate. And so I think we were all just like suspended for a moment. But that suspension is where all the nutrients is, I think. And, and I think that now, like, as we emerge, I'm hopeful that all those dreams that we want to do and things we want to achieve might just naturally float up. That's, that's how presence feels for me, you know? That is yeah, so powerful. I hope so. <laughs> I love yes. that. I love that. Yeah, it is good. So what do you dream of this new normal and how we will transform and most importantly, how can we adapt? So I think there's generational thing as well, but this new normal is a reality. Before it was just talk, talk, talk. But now we have obviously also, apart from COVID, we have also a reality called climate change that a lot of people have forgotten. But um, COVID has been a training ground for climate change because when that happens, it's going to be perhaps as fast as this has happened and will affect again, the entire world. So how would you adapt, transform, and, uh, and what also this new normal will, will look like in, in, your, in your views? Well, I mean, if I can jump in, I just really hope that people learn that we've been possibly living in a very unsustainable way for quite a while now. Um, and I hope that there will be some positive things i mean talking talking positive because that's the the name of the podcast but i do hope there are some positives that come out of this in terms of you know adam touched on um you know lessons that people learn will learn from it and and you know not rushing not panicking lisa as well touched on some but i just think it's key to remember that you know we are i guess actually to your point on the guest house we're all guests on this earth you know we're not you know, we're kind of temporarily here where, you know, we're lucky to be here. Um, we have a, a beautiful world um, that we we are doing our best to kind of rip apart in many ways. And mm -hmm. I, I just hope people take stock of, of the fact that, that we have this and we're so lucky and we need to be careful. We need to be careful with nature. We need to be careful with the world around us. We need to be um, aware that we can't have everything instantly, you know, at the drop of a hat and, you know, and, and, you know, those, that, those are the things I hope that, that we learn from it. And so when we build back, we're looking towards sustainable circular economies. We're not looking towards going back to how we used to do things. Um, 
but but I mean it's hard to know how how things will pan out um in terms with co in terms of coping with the the fear of you know the unknown and you know it it, it does touch a point though uh, touch upon those points around um you know being present and being in the moment that Adam was mentioning and Lisa you know around making the most of of the situation we're in and and not always wanting more not it's not always mm -hmm. the next thing or the next thing or the next thing it's it's you know appreciating that and that as a retired athlete is something I'm having to learn because it's not all about the next thing and the next goal and the next goal I'm learning to try and be more comfortable with you know my world now is a different world that that I'm living in as a former athlete but also a different world more generally um so yeah those are those are my thoughts to kick us off mm. Yeah, beautiful, really beautiful. beautiful. I mean, I kind of echo all of those thoughts. I think that if I can talk now, Adam, is that cool? Yeah, just jump in. Yeah, um, please jump in. Just the same, like, I think this slower pace of life that I think that has been so good for, for me and for so many people I know, um, I think that would be nice to be able to continue with this a little bit more, to be, like you said, more appreciative. I mean, here in the UK, Adam, the weather has just been so spectacular the last, you know, two, three months, two and a half months. It's just been incredible, you know, and nature and the birds and it's like the skies are blue and the air's fresher. And it's, you know, it's I, I really, really hope that it, that nobody rushes back to trying to get on planes and trying to get on. You know, I just want us to all slow down and just to see how mm -hmm. the planet is benefiting from this at the moment. I mean, I know that there's so much sadness and I know that a lot of people have lost their lives and it is an awful time, but at the same time, nature has been thriving so much. And I think that um, we need to show appreciation. We need to keep that appreciation, that gratitude for our planet um, and also for our loved ones. Cause so many of us haven't been able to see each other um, and hug each other and, you know, be in the same room. And I think that, that there's going to be a huge appreciation and, and so much more love for, for our loved ones mm -hmm. um, when we can eventually come out of lockdown and communication. I think it's, it's so important. You know, it's like picking up the phone, having FaceTime, going to see people when you speak to them, how are you? Are you okay? It's not just a, a, what do you want from them? It's like, how are you checking in with them? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that it will go to show that we don't have to jump on planes to do meetings. We can do, we can do it like this. We can, you know, meet up remotely from wherever we are in the world, you know, we can, we can help with our carbon footprint in that way. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there has to be some huge positives that come out of this whole negative situation. Um, and for me at the moment, nature is one of those, you know, like there's birds everywhere and it's just, it's beautiful. So, and the slower pace of life. So I've basically reiterated what you said. <laughs> <laughs> but very well said. <laughs> it's a hard basically. question. It is. It's such a hard question because, you know, it's, it's, it's to me, it's such a complicated question because there's the aspect that is so unnatural, right? In some regards that we're talking like this, right? But yet there's something about it that feels even more natural than what we were doing before because we never would have done this we would have been, I read a beautiful essay where a guy described time as, and moments as like these shredded piece of papers that he put out to see. You know, everything has been so out of time. You know, you're, you and I are having conversations over email. That's a time zone. We've had all these pockets. And that, that saving of time, that speed that we were getting was actually speeding up the, the life, our life expectancy. Expect, expectancy. We, we were getting more inflamed. The earth was getting hotter. We were getting hotter. Everything has just been so inflamed. And now I think we're all responding to the fact that we feel more fluidity and more connectivity. And I really hope that that remains. And I love hearing the birds and I love hearing nature and I don't have planes flying overhead and I can see the bottom of the, of the ocean, or the, the, you know, Long Island Sound, which I've never seen in my 38 years of living. So I hope that the artificial reality that we've created, that we were trying to fit into an old way of, our, our older way of nature, will now in this settlement find that perhaps we weren't, we weren't using this technology totally to its greatest benefit or, or properly. Perhaps we aren't supposed to be running off to, to be in the city for a meeting. 
perhaps we are going to be with our, our families and have this conversation here and connect and hopefully reach other people. But I'm curious to see what happens next. I, I really just have no idea, but I think it's, I, I think it's just a fascinating time. It's so fascinating. I'm, I'm mesmerized by what's occurring. Thank you very, very much. And, and I think it's time uh, for Q and A's. But um, somebody said to me uh, not that long ago, said, um, we have the opportunity to reinvent uh, the office, like, you know, the office space, the way that we go to work and all of that. Let's not go to the 1960 office in, a, you know, back to the future hoverboard, because that would have been complete waste of time. And I think this is what we need to think about. Like you said, Adam, how do we use this time and the technology and what we have learned that is possible, but with people at the center of it. So the people that have lost their yeah. life are not in vain. The people that have lost their jobs are not in vain. And we can actually reinvent the future in a much more positive uh, way, basically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so and holistic, holistic, I think. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things that um, the three of you have in common is values. And uh, having you in our office, having this conversation is totally bonkers and I love it. So uh, it's great because this would not have happened if this would not have happened. So again, thank you. Um, okay, time for questions. Um, thank you for an inspirational webinar. If you have to think about one positive thing uh, about this pandemic, uh, a positive thing this pandemic has brought us. So if you have to think about one positive thing in the pandemic uh, has brought us, I guess the question is like, what would that be? Anyone? I, mean, uh, I would say, um, apart from the, the kind of reconnection with nature it's reconnection with people um mm -hmm. even though we're not able to do it physically like we were all saying it's um we're able to have these kinds of conversations and you know to connect with anybody and i guess that's the the real advantage of you know all of the technology that we have um that's been created because it, it enables us to have these um the ability to, to connect this way, which we wouldn't have been able to do, you know, 30, 40 years ago, we would have mm. been completely isolated. Um, so I, I'd say we're lucky that we got the opportunity to be able to communicate and we're using that in, in a good way, as long as it's used in a good way, because it sometimes isn't. So it's important mm -hmm. to remember that as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, think I really deepening. agree. I, yeah, I like what I think, you say, Adam. It's like we have all this technology, but maybe we've been using it in the wrong way. That's what I, I yeah. love what you said there, yeah. you know, and it's, it's true. It, that's a really, really good point. Thank you. Yeah. And, and Susie, I, I think what I'm hearing you say, and I agree with it, it's just like everything, just we're deepening. There's a deepening occurring. We're looking at things, we're being more mindful, we're questioning things in a different way. At least I am. I have more time with my family. You know, I'm paying more attention to to just the world around me rather than this. I'm setting that aside, you know. Thank you. I think this is a question for you, Adam. How do you keep pushing and keep a positive attitude when you are a young business owner in this time, in a time like this? Uh, they say all start with your thoughts, but not that simple. Um, so as a business owner, I think... I, I can only speak my own experience. I've been very lucky these past couple of months and we've been very aware that we're lucky and we're giving back because of it. But, you know, we happen to make these butterflies that are handmade by my partner, Heidi, so brilliantly and people are responding magnificently to the story and the reflective quality of how they feel like butterflies right now. So business has been really thriving for us. Um, and so the question is how do, I, so where is the question? Let me just say, sorry. How do you rain focus on what you can control? Oh, Which sorry. Uh, I answered it live, so I kind of no, moved it's okay. to the next. Uh, the question, can you see any Posi of Well, I guess I feel, I feel really positive because it's going well. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough question to answer. And I, if it weren't going well, how would I remain positive? I think that I would, I think, I think I would, I would try and listen really to what people are wanting and needing. You know, I think for the butterflies, for example, people have been saying that they want to wear a symbol of transformation. 
so having the opportunity to speak with them, because I love working with my clients directly and having the opportunity to speak with them about what that means to them, that has given me such a fulfilling quality of life and helped me have, um, assisted me in, in keeping a really positive attitude. Thank you. Um, how do you let go of negative thoughts that might fuel self-doubt? This is to anyone. Lisa, <laughs> jump in. How do I let go of negative <laughs> thoughts? Um, it's about going back to the kind of routine that I like to have. You know, it's that it's that getting on my mat, doing some breathe, some breath work, um, mm -hmm. some mindfulness, some meditation. You know, just to try and look at the bigger picture. You know, um, and it's not always easy because some days you do let those feelings dwell, and that negativity can kind of like permeate sometimes. But I think if you just kind of step away from it and you just try and like I said, to look at the bigger picture, take a deep breath, take yourself out for a walk, you know, just try and do things. I love cooking. I love distracting myself in that way, making lovely, you know, yumminess. Um, so things like that really help me to get rid of the sort of negativity that might arise. Um, but yeah, just like write myself lists and sort of think about the bigger picture, really. I find that that really helps. Um, but again, with that routine, like doing some movement and some mindfulness and, you know, that really helps me to shift anything. Um, I think when I'm too stagnant, you know, that that's when things can kind of get a little funky for me. So I need movement. I need to either go for a walk or like I said, just do some stretching or some sort of class, um, and, and practice gratitude. I think gratitude is a really, really huge and powerful tool that we can all practice. Um, even even in the darkest moments when you think I've got nothing to be grateful for, you know, there are so many things, even if it's the smallest thing that can start really small and then it can just build and grow. And it's thanking your that's heart it. for beating. And, you know, it's Lisa, I think that <laughs> I think that's it. Yeah. I think that's what you just said. Like when I'm having those spinning, I and when it gets, you know, I think we all have really dark moments. It's about having all the senses working at the same time touch, taste, get, not to, I don't mean this word the way it's used, but get sensual, you know, stop yourself by touching nature, smell a flower and remember your mother, touch your child's hair, T you know, touch your beloved's face and look, that will take you, that will take you back. That will take you back to reality because I think that people who have negative thoughts like myself are people with overactive imaginations. So just touch something, I would say, reach out and touch something and smell it. That really helps me. It's subtle, but it's life. That's real life. And I think Lisa, that's what you were describing to me. Absolutely. Even just feeling your heart beating, you know, thank your heart beating. Yes. And you know, all it exactly. does, it doesn't, it doesn't, it just does stop it and reminds what you're you. doing. Mm. It just reminds you that we have, we do have so much to be thankful for. And I think that that just really helps to kind of manifest more positivity and more calmness within us. And it kind of helps to shift those negative, dark thoughts. Yeah, totally. I, I mean, I, I would totally agree. Gratitude for me, Lisa, totally right, is 100% something that you have to do. Um, you know, it's, it's the, the way to kind of flip things and reframe things. and. Um, to Adam's point around, you know, the sensory side of things, um, I find having an anchor sometimes helps. And by anchor, I mean, it can be a person, it can be an object, something you can touch in your pocket. And it, at the most kind of extreme levels of stress that I have, I sometimes, I know it sounds absolutely ridiculous, but you know, even if you have like a little pebble in your pocket or something and you just touch it, it brings mm -hmm. you back down. It's that kind of grounding element of it. So that's another thing, you know, is finding something that anchors you, but it could be a person. It could be just, you know, touching someone's face, like you say, or, or hair or something like that, or someone in your life that kind of brings that stabilizing influence. Yeah. Even just walking on, even on like taking your shoes off and walking on the grass, things like that. Just yeah. That's a great one. Yeah. That's a down. great one. Because it brings you back. There's so much in that sense memory too, because it, because it is present, but it's also the, like, the memories you want to hold on to. It's that physical, mm. tangible memory that just brings you back to humanity. Yeah. That's amazing. And I mean, um, I don't know how, but we got to the end of our time. Um, and I just wanted to really profoundly thank you for the last 45 minutes. 
And uh, what you have hopefully made everybody do is forget where we are and basically get this kind of breath of positivity to keep going. So mm -hmm. thank you, thank you, thank you again for your time and your patience on this. And I'd like to hand it on to Claudia now. So thank you very much, uh, everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. creating this. Thank you, thank yeah, you guys thank for creating you, this, for making this opportunity, this container for us to yeah. have this culture together. I'm so honored to be in your company. Thank you all. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Thanks to everyone. Thank you. My team, my team is the ones that are rock. So, yeah. <laughs> thank you, team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Adam. Thank you, Steve. And thank you, Lisa, for your time today, for this thank amazing you. webinar. Um, next week on Thursday at 2 p.m., we'll be discussing the power of new beginnings. Uh, so, if you haven't already, please register to our newsletter today to receive your invitation. And. Um, thank you all for joining again. Thank you for this uh, amazing webinar. Stay safe. Bye. Thank, thank you, you all. Okay. See you soon. Thank okay. you. Bye. 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 Bye.